Well, I think the core principles may focus on food production, uh, the very strong belief that food security is a key part of national security, uh, I think are, are things that stand the test of time. And I don't think the election result was a repudiation of my focus on that at all. Um, but clearly, within the rural communities, we saw uh, a number of very good conservative rural MPs who lost their seats. So we need to take the lessons on board from that. And there were certain things that I was doing which perhaps with a little more time, so the River Wye, for example, where we'd really focused on uh, the chicken litter, supporting farmers on food production through how they dealt with that waste, uh, I think will make a real difference. But obviously, that was a, I was there for six months before the election, so there was only a short period of time in terms of my role there. There seems to be a, a, a very great sense of settling down and, and trying to work out what the, the new regime will be like uh, and, and, and what prisms we should use to, to look at what they're going to do. So, you know, sit, st sitting here at a game fair, for example, are they going to be characterised by the old arguments of the kind of the conservation industry on one side and the hunt and shooting lot on the other? Um, is it going to be much more modern, as you suggest, uh, with uh, food production being the key? And I mean, they didn't mention much about the environment in their manifesto, did they? So do, can you call anything on any of that? Well, I think the ball will be obviously in the, uh, the Labour government's court, because obviously they will set uh, the agenda. Uh, and I think the key issue is really, I think most of us don't know, because very little has been said. There's only 87 words in the Labour manifesto. Uh, there's on, on farming, there's nothing said uh, at all in their manifesto on fishing. If you look at the King's speech last week where an incoming government sets out its priorities, there's basically nothing there for farming and fishing. Uh, and so the few things that have been said have been at a very high level, almost of the motherhood and apple pie. You know, we want to improve animal welfare type staff. So, I think what we've got to do is first see, well, what is going to happen with the agricultural budget? They've been silent on that. I know that's a, a big concern to many. We had committed an extra billion pounds over the parliament. Uh, we were willing to prioritize agriculture. They've been silent on that. So we can see the wider funding pressures uh, of things that they want to do. So we need to understand what the agriculture is going to be. Uh, one of the few things they have said is they want to um, uh, stop the badger cull. Uh, we had a science-driven approach in terms of extending that. I know that's a concern when I chat to many dairy farmers, but we're not clear what the timeline is. How soon did they want to stop that? Uh, I think most of us, um, certainly the advice I had in the department was the vaccinations won't be ready for some time. So how quickly did they want to, to stop that? Um, I think it's important to, to understand where they are on procurement because there's big opportunities outside the EU uh, around using our public sector spend more effectively to support uh, local produce um, produced to good welfare standards. Um, Labelling was something that I wanted to, to use our Brexit freedoms on and we'd pass the, the legislation on the, uh, the gene editing bill where again there's good opportunities but the details uncertain so I think we need to give the government uh, a fair opportunity. Uh, I think it's, it's incumbent on us to, to uh, allow them to set out their stall. Um, but my worry is they're very much an urban party. And if you look at, for example, trail hunting, it very much reflects an urban view of the countryside. I've represented a rural constituency, a big farming constituency for 14 years. And I look at what they're setting out on, on trail hunting. And once they've done that, then shooting probably becomes the next one that they go after already some of the, the groups affiliated to Labour are saying they want to, uh, to make inroads there. We've seen some of the things they've done in Wales. So, so I think we've got to wait and see, but nothing really in the King's speech, virtually nothing in the manifesto, concerns on the budget, uh, and concerns with the direction of travel. And I think we've just got to wait and see what they actually set out. We had Sir Jim Pace and Neil Parrish, both former colleagues mm. of yours, sitting in that chair earlier today, both independently said that when you have a, a key issue that kind of riles up the hard left, if it's private schools or Israel or fox hunting or whatever it is, they'll all come in and vote. And that is different to the run-of-the-mill policy, the, 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 you know, the ordinary stuff of government. And that Keir Starmer has that as a kind of bucket of red meat to keep tossing to these this faction and unfortunately much of what we do sits within that whether it's gun ownership pheasant shooting 
trail hunting. You know, we, we, we risk a lot. And everything we do by way of presenting the economic benefits, the environmental benefits, the social benefits of what we do will fall on deaf ears when there's a majority of the size they've got. What can we do in that situation? Well, I think we've got to work together. So, I mean, firstly, Sir Jim and Neil, both hugely experienced parliamentarians, and uh, come at this with a lot of knowledge, a lot of knowledge of the farming community, but also a lot of knowledge as to how Westminster uh, works. So I'm not surprised that their analysis of so that red meat and, and things not being science-led, evidence-led, but being done uh, for political partisan reasons. And we've just seen, you know, seven Labour uh, MPs suspended in the first... You know, a couple of weeks. Did you on cheer the King's speech? Did you go hooray? Uh, no, I, th I think <laughs> I, again. I, I think you know, as an opposition, we need to have the humility to listen to the general election result, to take on board lessons from that, and to be constructive um, and fair in our opposition. So I don't think that's sort of going after every single issue that goes by, like a kind of the generation game sort of a, a, approach. I think what we've got to do is is work with uh, rural communities, work with sectors as to. Uh, where best to pick our battles, because they do have a big majority, how we work together, uh, and in particular to be data, um, um, as a minister I was very data driven, people I think always thought that was my approach, and so I think when making these cases, what gives me optimism is yes, Labour has a huge majority, but it does now have an increasing number of MPs who are in rural seats, which it didn't have before, and I also think that the data, the evidence, supports our case on these issues. And I think, therefore, the opportunity for us is to work collectively, to pick our battles, uh, to set out how the science, the evidence supports the, the fact that um, many of these things are good for biodiversity, they're good for the rural economy. There's much more diversity in the jobs than sometimes some of the perceptions uh, may be. Uh, and so it's a question of how we work collectively to make that case in a way that is compelling to what is an urban-driven approach. And if I take my, my opponent, you know, my, uh, the, the current Secretary of State, his whole political career has been in inner city London. He was leader of uh, inner city London Council. He represents a London seat. Steve Reid. The late Steve Reid. Uh, if you look at the Labour Party, it's led by an inner city London uh, leader, the Prime Minister, but his predecessor, Jeremy Corbyn was an inner city London. His predecessor as leader was an inner city London, Ed Miliband. And Ed Miliband's approach, as we've seen on solar, is very much a sort of a, an urban driven approach. It's not one necessarily that's sympathetic to rural communities. So I think what we've got to do is work together, pick our battles, be led by the data, uh, and also hopefully bring some of those MPs that now represent rural constituencies in other parties uh, on board because obviously they will have a constituency interest in these issues. I want to pick up on that one just because just because you said it and we have had a few Tory leaders who have been pretty urban as well I and mean, I think we have to go back to David Cameron before we can say there's one with his heart in the countryside uh, and you know, looking at the manifesto from 2019 it was about as it was more anti-hunting and anti-shooting than the Greens which was pretty remarkable. You, you've had blips is, 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 I think, the message. But whether you want to answer that or not, if we, look, if we look forward, you are now saying we have to see what comes up, react to it. I, I'd, I'd like to know the strategy if it's something like fox hunting where they're not going to listen to the science, they're just going to try and ban it. What do we do then? Yeah, well, I mean, look, the election result points to the fact there have been challenges. Although uh, I would say that... Um, the current leader, the former Prime Minister Rishi Sunak, represents a very rural of constituency. Uh, I, as Secretary of State, represent uh, one of the most important farming constituencies in the country. Uh, and Mark Spencer, uh, I think is known to, to, to many here, is a farmer uh, and is very committed to the farming sector. So well, one of your own DEFRA directors described him as the Bolsonaro of the environment, though. <laughs> Zach Goldsmith. I, we can't forget that. Well... <laughs> but, so, and, and uh, in terms of, uh, quite rightly, Charlie, you said about focusing on, on the future. And I think hopefully my six months in post uh, in DEFRA gives a, a show not tell as to where my focus will be. And my focus will be first and foremost on food production. Uh, how do we address some of the volatility there's been 
Uh, and again, some of that volatility wasn't other governments making. You look at the volatility from the war in Ukraine, for example, and the impact uh, that had, the impacts of COVID and so forth. So, um, so not all of it, it was uh, from um, the government side. But clearly, there's been huge volatility. Uh, I think we had shown in recent months our willingness to listen very actively to the sector. If you look at the changes I made on SFI, for example, putting the cap in. So there was a, a perception that uh, too much farmland could go into rewilding. So we put the cap on that. Um, what was interesting there was my officials were at pains to say the data didn't support it. But almost every forum like this I came to, it was very much a live concern. And that's why we put the cap on. Uh, to make sure. If you look at, as I mentioned, the River Wye, where we had an approach which was uh, about uh, uh, targeting the environmental protections from a farm production perspective. Uh, the work we did on um, uh, the £427 million announced for, for equipment, so that if you've got a sprayer that uses 70% less pesticide, that reduces your costs for food production significantly, but it's self-evidently it's very good for the environment because it's 70% there. There was a concern that many of the environmental grants were going to NGOs, not farmers. So things like the Species Restoration Fund, I changed it so only farmers could apply for it because 70% of land is farmland. Therefore, if you're targeting the environment and species restoration, let's do it through farmers, not with someone else doing it and then co-opting farmers uh, on board. So my whole approach, likewise with the arm's length bodies, if you look at Dartmoor, uh, where... We had a very good review at Dartmoor about concerns with Natural England's uh, approach. Uh, this this and again, is about access, particularly? Yeah, well, also grazing uh, and whether Natural England was... Well, firstly, it wasn't resourced. They only had one and a half uh, FTE, so a lot of the farming community were, were facing huge delays and uncertainty. There's a question, was Natural England trying to take them back to a, a, a data point that didn't exist uh, in terms of restoration? And also ignoring, actually, the... The, the habitat on Dortmund was because of uh, the farmers and the custodians that had actually grazed it in the way that they had. Uh, and, and equally, if you were asking someone to, to remove livestock from uh, the common, but then not giving planning permission for them to be overwintered, you know, the left hand and the right hand, the sense was not being joined up. So those were the sort of things that, in that case, I worked with Geoffrey Cox, so Geoffrey uh, uh, on, um, in terms of our response on, on Dartmoor. So, so my whole approach as Secretary of State was very much, how do we support food production, food security? And through that, it's not an either or on the environment, but I do think, as Minnette Batters said, it's two sides of the same coin. So how do we do it from a food production lens? And that's very much the approach in opposition, we will continue to take. That's making the case from, from your side, of, I suppose. But you know, would they? They haven't said very much about the environment. Will they suddenly, even if it's in five years' time for their next manifesto, suddenly say, right, from now on, the environment is absolutely at the heart of what we're going to do, and farming is out the window? Well, we've got to look at things like the land management strategy. Um, I mean, the fact is, one of their biggest donors is the Just Stop Oil uh, guy. The Secretary of State uh, himself, I think, has. Uh, has had donations from uh, one of the leading advocates for rewilding. We've seen what they've done in Wales, where they've taken lots of farmland, or suggested taking lots of farmland out of production. So those are the things we firstly need to wait and see what they do, because, as I say, it is quite remarkable how little has been said. Um, there's also a question as to what the Treasury allows them to do. Uh, and there's also, as I know, you know, having been a Secretary of State in four departments, having twice been a Minister in the Treasury, that you also need a, a deferred Secretary of State that has the clout at the Cabinet table when Ed Miliband and the Energy Department are making their demands or when, um, you know, there's pressure from, from other departments like, uh, like um, housing, uh, uh, energy, wherever it may be. So, so these things we need to see how DEFRA performs. I think we've got to be fair and constructive in our opposition. Um, but it is concerning that an urban-driven party has said so little about farming and fishing when things like the King's Speech are their opportunities to set out their priorities. And, let, and let's be honest, they've had 14 years to prepare. So it's not as if they haven't had time to work out what they wanted to say about farming uh, and fishing. And we were clear 
uh, in our prioritization, so on, on trail hunting, for example, we were clear in our manifesto uh, that we would protect it. They have said they want to get rid of that. On badger culling, we had taken a science-driven uh, approach supported by the chief vet. They've said they want to stop that. And what we don't know is, well, how soon did they want to stop it? What impact assessment have they done? What does the modeling show on the impact uh, uh, of ending the call. And, and that's the sort of detail we need to see. You're being, you're being wonderfully scientific again, which we're, we're, we're terrified they won't be. Daniel Zeichner is coming here tomorrow, uh, the new uh, Minister for the Environment under uh, Steve Reid. Uh, and uh, he has come here these last three years and gradually, I think, learned more and more about shooting. It's been a joy to see, actually. Mm. Uh, he uh, gets you know, advice from Basque. He seems to be very even in the way he approaches things. However, he says, I cannot protect you from the Parliamentary Labour Party. There is nothing I can do, you know. And if they are all howling for the end of trail hunting, trophy imports, whatever it is, then I'm afraid that, you know, he, he says that that's what they will try and get. But that just doesn't wash, does it? You can't wait 14 years to be a minister and then say, it's my party, but it's nothing to do with me. And... Um, so that's where we've got to see beneath the, the generic headlines uh, or the omissions to comment, and we need to see uh, the detail. But I think where there's, again, let's look for the positives. The fact that uh, Daniel has been here and perhaps has himself been on the journey through the information, the support, the, uh, the learning that has come out of that. Uh, I think there is important work that Basque and others are doing in terms of with new MPs, uh, through the likes of the APPG, the all-party parliamentary group, uh, to help other MPs become more aware of what the data, what the science, uh, what the conservation case is around some of these issues. And I think that's where certainly you will find a, a friend and supporter within uh, the Conservative Party in terms of wanting to work to present that data uh, in a way, in a very constructive way, uh, to the government of the day. Uh, and I think there will be a particular question for some of those new MPs, if I take Cambridgeshire. There's a number of, of new MPs uh, in Cambridgeshire representing uh, rural areas. Uh, and it will be incumbent on them to, to look at how they're best uh, supporting their areas. And a slight trend towards the Green Party. I mean, there's a huge rural constituency in Suffolk has gone green, hasn't it? Which is, is never well, well, so, uh, A number of colleagues, uh, Bill Wiggin and uh, Therese Coffey, um, um, uh, Waveney was yeah, so a number a number of seats seats uh, there. So uh, so again, these 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 are, are points we need to bring across. Right. So what I should ask Daniel tomorrow. So last year I asked him, how can you ban trail hunting without banning dog walking? Mm. And he gave me the answer about you know not seeing the detail of the legislation yet, and therefore I can't really answer that question. So what shall I ask him this year to kind of keep his feet to the fire in front of a game fair audience? Uh, well, I think uh, to end the uncertainty. I think there's so many areas uh, of uncertainty, uh, and I do think it's reasonable after 14 years of time to prepare, for now that they're in government, they didn't do that in the area you'd expect them to, the manifesto. They didn't do it in the next area you'd expect them to, the King's Speech, which sets out the government's priorities. Uh, and I think you know businesses need to be able to make decisions. People need to be able to plan uh, for their future. Uh, and I think it's important, therefore, to be able to say to the dairy farmer, if you're going to end badger culling, on what date? Uh, if you're going to change land use, in what way? If you're going to change inheritance tax, uh, are you going to tell us when and in, uh, in what way? What are the thresholds that uh, apply? Um, there's so many areas of uncertainty, it's quite remarkable. Uh, for a government that is now in office. And uh, I find it a, a little surprising if he then says, not only can I not tell you what my government's policy is or when it will apply or how it will be funded, but I also can't tell you how I'll persuade my own parliamentary colleagues to support what it is I can't tell you we will be doing. I think that seems a, shall I say, a slightly novel approach right, well, we'll, to we'll government and, and, and one where I'm sure, Charlie, you can have some fun probing. We will wait, we'll <laughs> wait until tomorrow. I've got one, one last thing, which, which is a much more general question. It worries me that over the last 25 years we've seen a downgrading of DEFRA in, in Westminster. It is, you know, it's so obviously a devolved uh, matter and therefore doesn't matter to the government of Westminster. It's been pushed out to Scotland and Wales. 
is that is that a fair reading of it, or uh, or am I being unfair? I, I don't, I, I, and I know where that comes from because when I was moved from Secretary of State for Health, there's quite a few of the lobby journalists that wrote that you know was it a, a demotion, and I think they took that because they look at the Department of Health budget, 168 billion pounds, and look at the DEFRA budget, closer to eight billion, and go well, it's a much smaller uh, budget. But I think that's a misreading, uh, and it's misreading. Uh, for two reasons. I think firstly, in years gone by, when so many of the decisions covered by DEFRA were set at an EU level, then obviously it had far less autonomy. Whereas now outside the EU, there are much more opportunities on things like gene editing. Again, you may want to ask uh, Daniel, where's the secondary legislation? When are they going to produce the secondary legislation to give full force to the huge commercial opportunity that the gene editing bill allows us to do because we're outside the EU. Now, we've passed that primary legislation. Uh, the, the, the Prime Minister keeps saying he wants growth. Well, within the DEFRA space, the gene editing legislation is a huge opportunity uh, for growth, drought, and, and disease-resistant crops. So where's the urgency on getting the secondary legislation uh, through? So I think one of the things uh, about DEFRA is it now, outside the EU, has much more autonomy around its land use strategy, around uh, its marine uh, strategy as well, spatial strategy there, uh, around programs like the SFI, that's the most successful program. Uh, and certainly in other countries, when I speak to ministers in other countries, they're massively interested in uh, the innovation uh, that we're able to. I mean, 50% uh, of basic payment went to just 10% of farmers. We're able to now have much more freedom uh, and control. So that makes the death of all more interesting. And then secondly, whilst yes, the Department of Health budget is huge, so much of that is already spent. Because obviously a huge chunk of that is going to the hospitals, the GPs, the doctors, the nurses, the agenda for change. Whereas actually within uh, DEFRA, there is more scope for the Secretary of State of the day to shape the policy agenda because a lot of these things have come back uh, as a result of our exit from the European Union. And then lastly, for me, as a, a rural MP, and if I look at the uh, general election result and the amount of change we've seen in rural constituencies, including from the Lib Dem uh, seats that were gained, I think in political terms, DEFRA is hugely uh, important. So, so both as a constituency MP, I think it's a hugely important department, uh, I think to the rural economy, it's very important. I think politically, in terms of rural seats, it matters greatly. And I think in terms of autonomy for a Secretary of State, there's much more there than used to be the case. And that aspect of the story tends to be lost when people just look at the headline numbers and say, as Secretary of State for, for DEXU or for the Cabinet Office or Chief of Staff in Number 10, you know, there was much more autonomy to your role than when you're DEFRA secretary. Because actually, within DEFRA, there was a lot of policy scope to, to, to change the focus. And that's certainly what I was seeking to do with the focus on food production and food security. Thank you, Steve. Good answer, full answer. Ladies and gentlemen, Steve Barkley, Shadow DEFRA secretary. Thank you very much. <laughs>